And we are live. Welcome to the show, everyone. The Moximo Show here at VOD Pod Media. My name is Moximo, your host, as always. And you're in for a treat tonight, folks. If you're into business, if you're into leadership, if you're into the Latina CEO, we have the original <laughs> Latina you. CEO. And we're going to jump right in. Sure. Janie Martinez Gonzalez, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being here tonight. You know, we were talking a little bit uh, before we fired up the cameras here tonight, folks. And we hope you'll give us a like, comment, share. Uh, wherever you're watching from. Um, but, you know, it's been a long time since yeah. we, you know, we've been talking about getting you on the show. We know your time is valuable with all of the responsibilities, the lifestyle that you lead. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank How you are you? Invitation. I'm good. I'm in good spirits. Excited to be here. So we were talking about a little bit about your sleep schedule because we know how much <laughs> is on your plate on a regular basis. Do you live off caffeine? I actually don't live off caffeine. I, I average, I do three cups of coffee in the morning <laughs> and then that's it throughout the day three big cups not no, just a little actually, they're not actually i don't i don't take any like additional caffeine i do my three cups of coffee every morning and we're ready to go and then you're raring then we're ready to go and you're yeah. ready to go and yeah. so folks if you don't know janie please google her i will just lead with uh, Hispanic executive has acknowledged her as a tech pioneer legend. How does that make you feel when you hear that? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, regardless what title you're, you're given, I, I'm very humble about, about it all. Cause at the end of the day, you know, I got work to get done and regardless of the title, um, I just get my work. I really just focus on getting the job done and I don't really focus on the titles. Well, you know, listen, that, the reason I ask that as well is because it is earned. Mm -hmm. You started your business some 30, 30 years ago. Yeah, it'll be 30 years in November. Okay, so congratulations Thank on you. that anniversary. Are you going to throw a party and am I invited to it? Maybe. Woo, let's go. <laughs> I usually we knew throw we a party get some, for those events. Yeah. And it's good to do that. It's yeah. festive. It matches the brand. Oh, absolutely. You know? yeah. I mean, I'm known for at least, you don't see me all year, but I always at least throw an annual party for sure. There you go. So let me, I, you know, we got to talk a little bit about a lot. We're going to jump around. We're sure. going to kind of move around in your illustrious career, talk about the past, present, and future. You know, when Janie was a young girl, did you know what you wanted to do when you were a grown-up? No. You know, I grew up in a very traditional, you know, Mexican family, the oldest of five. And I would say my earliest recollection, uh, my earliest memory of what was expected of me was just responsibilities. I mean, as, as the oldest, like typical female in a Hispanic, Mexican-American culture, Catholic, Pentecostal, Baptist <laughs> family that I was raised, um, I just knew early on that I was just responsible for everybody. Um, I think that even though I knew I had a lot of responsibility at a young age, I was very self-aware that what was around me was not enough for me and that I definitely wanted to change my circumstances. I couldn't label it, but I just kind of knew that I thought and acted and responded differently, but I still maintained the expectations of me, if that makes sense. It does make sense. So fast forward today, you know, tell us a little bit about Webhead. Sure. I mean, I think Webhead was, uh, you know, I'm an internet pioneer. So before, you know, the internet was commercialized, world, the World Wide Web was around, um, and web development was commercialized or hosting, or a lot of the software as a service products that you see here today, uh, we were pioneers of that. And the ideas uh, stem from being exposed to the internet while it was being established here in San Antonio. And so for me, when I walked in and I got exposure to parallel computing and how servers spoke to servers and how this business model actually worked, it was something that immediately not only just piqued my interest, but someone who was just naturally very social could see how it would transform, as cliche as it sounds, the way we live, work, and play. So it became really the beginning for me to finally have, you know, not just the education that I had so fought so hard to, to get, but it actually aligned itself with a potential um, career, a potential opportunity for myself that I could not see before. You know, it was easy for me to fight as a first-generation student 
to go to college and then you're in college and you're still trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life. And I think being exposed to that was the first time that it became very clear that this was my way to create, this was my way out, <laughs> but it was also a way to create wealth and it was also a way to create an exceptional opportunity for myself. And that really became the catalyst to everything that I do today. Everything that I do today, whether it's serving on a board, whether it's being a parent, whether it's leading, you know, organizations or whether it's, you know, leading web hit, really the foundation is really cultura and technology and how there's in communication, the conversions of all three have been pillars in, in everything that I do. Yeah, you know, lot a lot to hear from all of this. Um, I want to give a shout out to our families that allow sure. us to do this work. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, you know, being in a position where you're in high demand, people are always calling you, you're always, you know, sending emails out quickly, you're going to meetings, mm -hmm. you know, we got to give a shout out to our families that allow us to do the work and support us and love us and let us chase our dreams. Sure. You know? I, I would correct you with the word allow. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just describe so that tell me, I was tell raised us. in a very traditional family? You know, is it really allow? Or is it that you create a space for yourself and you have to surround yourselves, whether people agree or not, to that this is who you are. I think if you're gonna be successful in anything that you do, you have to be honest and you have to communicate that honesty with the people that are that are part of that ecosystem, right? Husband, children, employees, etc. right? That, you know, this is what you want and this is what you're going after and it's not gonna be pretty all the time and you're not gonna always be the best and, and everything, and what I mean by the best in every role that I have, mother, daughter, you know, niece, uh, aunt, you know, all the, all the different roles that I have. I, I think that you, you should not, they don't allow me to do it. I choose to do it. And they have, they have to choose to be part of that. <laughs> it's, it's the other way around. Well, there you go. And so, words matter. So that, no, and I'm glad you stated <laughs> that as well, because. Me. And that's something I really work on. Cause I can't say that I would say that the young Janie, the Janie today will will say that well that's good i mean let's let's bring it you, that's your style that's right. who you are right? right describe to me a little bit about your style of leadership i think it's very authentic it's very raw um it's intense and i would think those would be the three things that describe my leadership style she says intense folks <laughs> and so why intense i think there's a lot of intensity when you're passionate right yeah. i mean intensity is passion it's a very determined uh, approach. And it's also, you know, to me, intensity is really about the intensity and in how you execute. And, and I do think that those are three things that are, are define a lot of how I operate. You know, I'm very passionate. You know, the intensity and in how I execute is pretty high level. And then, uh, you know, it's a good way just to describe my leadership. Well, hashtag real talks. <laughs> That's right. You got to love it. And you know, our tagline here at the show is people, culture, power talks, right. because we always leave people inspired. People say, Hey, Maximo, what's your show is about? What is your show about? And it's about a lot of different things, but it's about people, culture, and power talks to leave you sure. empowered, to leave you engaged. And you know, someone like yourself, you know, you, with growing up, you mentioned you were ambitious. You were looking for, you know, a way to explore your career, to create wealth. Someone like you could have, graduated from college and got a job at a major, you know, uh, organization, right? Like an AT&T or an Apple or something like that. You decided to go your own route. Well, you know, in fairness, I'm not quite sure if even at that age, I, I could see myself at AT&T. You have to understand my background. I mean, again, you know, I'm a product, I'm a border baby, right? Uh, my father <laughs> is today a citizen, but Mexican father, you know, an American mother, you know, Laredo, no Laredo, and they had a hard time growing up. Both of them grew up without parents. Uh, they they obviously joined forces and, and did the best that they could to, to raise these five kids, but it was in a very traditional way. Mom was at home, you know, dad worked, dad ruled the house, and mom just did whatever dad said. And, and, and yet, you know, I'm not quite sure being raised in, in a very traditional patriarchal family uh, in a limited scope of our exposure that even at 17, 
I knew that I could work for a corporation. And part of it is when you really think about the way we were raised, I mean, and San Antonio is a great example. I think a lot of us, San Antonio is big, but it's also very segregated and people stay in their own zip code, right? And unless you have parents who are exposing you outside of your zip code or are talking to you about your potential, your potential is small in scope. So like you mentioned, I think originally for me, my potential was like, just graduate from high school, <laughs> right? And then you get exposed and you're like, okay, now I graduated from high school. Now maybe I graduated from college. And then your scope increases, right? And then time, luck, perseverance, exposure, then allows you to grow that scope. I don't think a lot of us initially had that big scope, right? Statement, yeah. of, statement of work for ourselves that immediately we think corporate. I think a lot of us are byproducts of our environment. And until you step out of that environment and you really realize that there's a world bigger than what you were exposed to, then it's hard to kind of frame what you're going to be, right? And I think a lot of first-generation students, a lot of Latinos, immigrants, face that challenge. And so what you find is that different people enter, there's different entry points for different people. It's not all the same. Yeah, well, we interview a lot of people. I would consider myself to be a people specialist, a people person. I've right. studied people. You're a fascinating person. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and I state that because you I have this. I don't know if that's a compliment or is that. No, no, it's a compliment. <laughs> you, you have this bravado and this swagger to yourself. Do you get that often? Do people say like, hey, you know, Jane, you got like this yeah, charisma. Yeah, I do. This I personality. Do. I do. I mean, I think that that's, if you want to call it the special sauce, I think that there you go. from birth to today, I, I don't approach things. The same way that everybody does, I, I, you know, I can definitely light up a room, but I could also, <laughs> you know, at the same time that intensity can turn people off. I, I think that people focus more on trying to figure me out than it is to just kind of like embrace it. Because with anything that I do, there's never that intention of, of you know, of, of hurting someone with it or using it against them. Or even to the point of knowing that I have the power to do so, to take advantage of the situation. Yeah. I think it just just who I am, and and you know, um, yeah, it's it's one of the things that I can natural that I that is part of my natural gift. Right? Well, you know, when we talk about leadership, and you are a leader, a lot of people know you. A lot of people ask me, hey, do you know Janie? When we're going around town, sure. we see you out all over the place. You're in the newspaper. You're doing speeches. You're doing the luncheon keynotes. You know. When you're in a position of leadership under the spotlight, that draws attention. It draws, mm -hmm. you know, fans, detractors, you know, all of those sorts of things. Guylan and I were talking before you came in and we were mentioning, hey, a lot of people like Moximo. He, they like his show. They like how he presents himself. But there's just as many people who say, hey, man, that guy's a fraud, man. We can't believe this guy's still doing that show mm -hmm. yet. Yeah, I get, I get the good and the bad, too. Well, let's let, let me ask you. <laughs> let's what, start with the bad. <laughs> well, let's what what do people misunderstand about Jay? Uh, then I'm not approachable. Um, uh, that I could be uh, judgy and that um, probably those are the two. <laughs> and, and it's interesting. Um, I'm very private, which is what people don't realize. Yeah. That. I may be a public person, but I think people sometimes confuse the persona with who you are inside. I think that people tend to forget that all of us, regardless of the public positions that we're in, uh, celebrity, you know, if you're a media, a media, you know, um, specialist, yeah, host, yeah. Or host or personality, I'm personality, sorry. or you're a community le uh, civic leader or politician, whatever that, that category is that you're a human being. You have, you, there's a core value of who you are and, and that you can still be private and be public. And I think that sometimes people confuse that persona with who you really truly are. And not that I'm saying I'm fake about it, but I think that there are moments where people just don't want to accept you for who you are at that moment. They want to tackle on either their insecurities or their issues or what they've heard, but they don't even give you the time or the opportunity um, to really know you. They've already come with a very preconceived notion, right? And so, but then, then I also live off energies, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really, again, you mentioned are you a people person. I would say that one of my strengths is to walk into a room and, and see 100 people and hone in on the energies, right? And to hone in when people approach me, 
whether they're being authentic to me. So I can quickly tell within <laughs> seconds that you're reading me and analyzing me versus really getting to know me, which then would work that in immediately I'm going to just zone you out. And so then that is interpreted as, oh my God, she's just not approachable or, you know, what's her problem? She thinks she's badass or, <laughs> and it's not, it's just that you can clearly, you can clearly understand where you stand with them from just a simple greeting. Yeah. And, and I think that that's what people don't understand when you're out there a lot in the public, you get a really good sense of who's approaching you very sincerely, who is not, and who is there to analyze you so they can have an alternative motive. And that's what's really interesting about being engaged with people all the time. And so I have this gift, and at the same time, you know, this skill I've developed over time that you're constantly navigating the different environments, and right there and then, you know, you, you, you are navigating these energies and what people think about you and still smile and still be productive and still make sure that you accomplish that objective. And that can be sometimes exhausting, which then leads to wanting a lot of quiet time yeah. or saying no to certain personalities that really, at the end of the day, do you more harm than help. You know, you're touching on so many good subjects, but one of the things I wanted to hone in on, because you mentioned patriarchy, mm -hmm. you know, women are often, you know, scrutinized to a higher degree and yes, more negatively are. than men. Oh, Why does it got to be that way? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, you got to understand how civilization was founded, right? I'm not going to yeah, go back to a whole history lesson, right? But we're in 2023, though. I, but, I mean, but I think, again, a lot of it has to do when you really think about it, let's just start with policies. Let's just talk, let's talk about how, you know, cities were conquered, right? It, it was never, it was based on, again, you know, uh, conflict, right? And, and, and in order for you to gain power, you have to control, right? And so you don't maintain power if you don't control. And so women have been conquered and controlled for, for, for me. And it hasn't really changed. You know, people approach me all the time, Latina this, Latina that, and we're in power, and we're this and that. And I would definitely say, if, if I reflect my career, absolutely women are in a much better position. We're in a stronger position uh, you, than we were before. But at the end of the day, the policies still don't support us. And so policies is a form of control. So when you have policies that dictate our reproductive you know, choices, when you have policies that dictate what women can make, even though it's equal, you know, what, when you have, well, let's just take that one out. But when you have policies just simple on, you know, reproductive rights, that in itself will demonstrate to you how women are still controlled in the biggest way possible, right? And yet this is what, the 21st century? And people are still using that against us, <laughs> and, you know? <laughs> and I don't want to go into that, whether you're yeah, pro or against certainly, it. That's your yeah. choice. That's next week, folks. <laughs> Tune in. But my point is, is that, there are p policies, there are systems that have been designed to, to, to keep us in that situation, whether it's family structure, whether it's corporate structure, whether it's political systems. And women are not just fighting one thing, we're fighting all those things I just described. And so when it's, there's a lot of things that are designed uh, to keep you there. Not only are you like not just fighting to be at the table, you're, you're fighting institutional structures that make yeah. it very difficult, not just for women, but minorities in general to rise to be who they want to be. And it's exhausting and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's hard, but you with, with time and experience and emotional maturity and, you know, a, a true understanding of the system, then you can chip away. But I, I think that women still have a significant uh, ways to go because the systems are still not designed for minority minorities in general and women specifically of color to succeed in these environments with policies and procedures and controls right in place. Uh, it, it's really hard. Well, there's certainly people that are pushing the envelope and people that are getting involved and people that are trying to create change in a lot of different ways. And, Absolutely. And I you are one time. of them. You are I, one I of them in this ecosystem. I consider myself a change agent and, and one that from, from, you know, childhood to now that I do challenge the system. Yeah. That I do fall on the sword a lot because 
I rather, I rather, you know, again, I, I believe that part of my leadership and part of fate or part of whatever you want to call it is that you you got to have courage to chip away at it because if I if I don't do it, who else is going to do it? Yeah. Because the system has different types of people. The 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 politician that's going to do the right thing that everybody loves, but behind the scenes is making sure <laughs> that they stay in office. No. And, and say, tell me it doesn't happen. It happens. <laughs> you, then you have the agitators. You know, you you have so many different roles that people play to reinforce the system, right? And I would say 1% of us are dedicated to breaking down the system, which is not enough of us. Well, you know, what can you tell us about that? How do we, more people get involved? Because why yeah, so try? Some people don't want to try. Some people will say it's voting. You know, I, I think voting is important. I think that's part of it. But, but I really think it starts with how we're raised. I think it starts with our parents. But then you kind of go back to when you're first generation, your parents don't know, then how do they help you? You know, and I think that's where mentors come in. Yeah. I think that, you know, um, it starts at home. Somebody has to talk to some, to you and say, Janie, there's a different way. And this is how you do it. And I think that a lot of us are, are learning on the, it's like on the job training. You are doing the job. You are fighting to be at the table. You're learning how to do the job. And then on, on, on top of that, you know, you're also being educated on top of doing the job. And, and, and that's what's kind of the opportunity. And again, the challenge for individuals like us, right? It really starts at home. And I think that as a parent, my parents did better for me. And then I'm doing better for my children. Yeah. And I know that in raising children, I was very determined to stop the blue collar mentality and, 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 and try to work on, you know, how we speak, how we frame things and how we empower our children was very different than the opportunity that I had. And so I was very deliberate in how I raised my origin, my first three children that are grown ups, uh, because I wanted to make sure that they were better positioned and I had to work so hard at chipping at the system because they were going to be more strategic in their approach. Yeah. Less chipping and more deliberate uh, steps that they could take. Because yeah. I provided them, I empowered them, or I provided them the right platform for them to launch off versus not me. I didn't have a launching pad. I just kind of got, I just threw myself, you know. To the wind. To the wind or the <laughs> ocean. And was trying to figure out how to swim at a very young age. And well, so, yeah. And that's certainly the goal to leave, the, you know, the, the next generation better off. I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to set the next person up for success. Yeah, we do. And, and I don't think there's enough of us to, to help everybody. Um, and I think that is also still another opportunity and challenge for us as minorities, that there's just not enough of us still at the table to somehow, you know, scale it up. Mm -hmm. I, I still think that we're, we're, we're not, we don't have enough scale up opportunities to kind of change that and drastically make a, not just a dent, but instead of hitting these constant base hits, to be able to consistently hit some better, you know, uh, yeah. home runs. Hit the cycle like we're, Altuve we're not there last yet. night. We're not there yet, but definitely I think that there's been vast improvement in a lot of areas, but we're, we're definitely not we're there. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And I appreciate the sports analogy. You're yeah, a sports person. I'm a very big sport. Yeah, I use a lot of sports analogies. So are you getting ready for football season? I'm getting ready for basketball season. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Here, San sure. Antonio. And soccer. Yeah. Oh, I love soccer and basketball. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting, you know. Um, very competitive, and of course, it's easy to relate to sports. So I don't care what the sport is. I just like sports in general. Did you grow up playing sports? I did. You know, I wasn't like uh, uh, the best at it, um, but for sure, I mean, basketball and, and track were probably my strongest sports. And, you know, I think that what I learned in sports was you didn't have to be number one in it. You just had to be ready to rise to the occasion and, and give your best and that allowed me to then continue you know to improve and to be asked to to still join a team right you learn your role you learn your strength and then you just maximize it to be competitive yeah and sports teach you a lot about you know life and how you maneuver how you uh embody and personify those same skills that you practice in business yeah. or as a leader. i mean i would say that again showing up is yeah winning. being present 
uh, being consistent. Oh, absolutely. You always improve your score. And then and I think knowing knowing your role and, and, and being okay with it are the three, I think, uh, key ingredients to anything that you approach in life. Yeah. So we talk about people being consistent, showing up, being involved, being genuine, all of those characteristics you embody. And those that has been told to me by other people. Right. People have said Janie is very authentic. She's very real. She's very genuine. People say Janie is a businesswoman. People have told me that, you know, and as you should be with your organization that you founded. Which I think I find shocking, right? That I'm a businesswoman. <laughs> well, that's what. And again, which is that's, ironic, right? Because I think that that's one of the biggest criticisms I get you know it's interesting they want they want us to be business women or we want to be business women then you're a business woman and then your 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 um how you approach business and how you conduct business then are heavily scrutinized which is very interesting i just had that conversation with someone in my office today when i made a decision she said oh it's because you're aggressive <laughs> or because I, I've also heard, oh, you make that decision because you're a type A. Ooh. And I say, it's interesting. Men would never be told yeah. that they make a decision because they're aggressive or they're making a decision because they're type A, right? And, and I corrected that. And I said, am I aggressive or am I just assertive and I know what needs to be yeah. done or am I just decisive? And so because I'm very decisive and because I'm very assertive and because I'm very deliberate, very intentional, and I'm very goal-driven at our company, I measure everything that we do and I analyze everything that we do. As you um, should. You have a responsibility to do I, that. I, and not only that, but you know what I tell always my staff, I have a fiduciary responsibility, number one. Mm -hmm. Everything else is second nature. Yeah. That fiduciary responsibility is to my board of directors. It is to my financial institutions. It is to my employees. It is to my clients. And I think that that's what people don't understand what it is to be a business owner. The market, the branding of who you are is important. It's part of it. The, the business development is part of it. The corporate development is part of it. But at the end of the day, to run a successful business, those, those things that I just described, yeah is more important than anything. And I think that um, somehow, regardless of my 30 years of, of running a company, people still say, oh no, she's just a face of Webhead. Or, you know, and it's amazing how after all these years, no one would ever consider this these hardcore things that I do on a daily basis on top of everything else, right, that I'm responsible for. And I take those to heart. You know, my, my dad raised me, you know, there was a lot of things my dad did that I didn't agree with or, you know, was that, you know, was uh, caused some dysfunction in how I operate sometimes too. But I will say that one thing my dad taught me was your word is your word. Your name matters, right? Like your last name, how you represent your family yeah. matters. And that's something that I have always um be that that matters to me so you you can say i'm not approachable you can say i could be you know a little snooty you can call me all those things but what you cannot say is that i don't pay my bills <laughs> that i don't meet my fiduciary responsibility to everything that i just described yeah you know and i think that those that matters to me more sometimes than anything else titles or awards because at the end of the day in the business world the first thing that you're going to be uh, evaluating on is can you read a P and L profit? Can you run a book? Can you run a you know balance sheet? Yeah. Can you are can you do you know how to meet compliance? Do you know how to do these like you know? Uh, and I think that sometimes again we all want to be CEOs. We all right away slap that title on ourselves without realizing that that core responsibility of what it means to be a chief executive officer. Well, you've earned all the recognition <laughs> that you've received, the Thank good you. recognition, Thank I should you. say, Sorry because because you, I mean, listen, the awards that you have, you know, earned over the years, sure. the fact that your business has been as successful as it has for so long, the contracts and the relationships sure. and all the things that you've done. A lot of people know you, a lot of people look up to you. Right. And, you know, right now you are the board president at CPS Energy, the first ever Latina to ever serve in the organization's over, what, 130 year well, history? Well, they've been in existence in 140, almost 144 years, and there's only been seven women who have served as a trustee, a board of director for CPS Energy. Uh, I am the first uh, 
along with the first Hispanic CEO to serve in that role. Yeah. And the first one to represent my area. Uh, I represent probably the, the third largest quadrant area of the city of San Antonio. And yes, it's a big responsibility. I've been <laughs> in that. And I've been in that for the for the first six months and it's been um, challenging and an opportunity at the same time. And, yeah. and I think it's not challenging because I don't have the business acumen and the skill sets to do it. But when an organization, regardless of CPS Energy, and you see it at City Council as well, and you're seeing it across the nation, is changing in, in, in gender, more women. Look at the City Hall. How many women do you have in office today? Six. That's exactly. So as more women are in positions of authority, I think that, you know, outside of CPS, um, I think organizations are struggling with that. And then we are struggling. I think we're both struggling to be at the table with each other because it is not common, right? And, uh, and you know, it's a wonderful organization. You know, anything that I do, I don't do um, lightly. I think I, there was a lot of thought that went into that. It was a, an extensive process. Yeah. You have to be confirmed. And so you go through lots of interviews and city council has to uh, confirm you. And I was happy to report I got unanimous confirmation, which was a testament really frankly to years of being in the community and being true to myself and tree yeah. and uh, building credibility. Because honestly, I didn't think I would get it because I really <laughs> wasn't, you know, I wasn't really like, oh my God, I knew every city council person, you know, and every, you know, I really had, by then had distanced myself a lot from local politics and, and to still be confirmed and now to, to be uh, the chairman. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a privilege, but it's work. It's a lot of work. And, um, you know, it's a sizable budget. <laughs> <laughs> we, we represent 38% of the city's budget. Wow. Um, and what, what I mean by that is that the, the revenues that are generated from CPS Energy, uh, uh, we, we basically give a million, we, we give, give the city of San Antonio a million dollars a day, and that equates to 38% of the city of San Antonio's budget. And therefore, that kind of just demonstrates uh, how valuable CPS is to the city of San Antonio, the economic development engine that it is and then the attention that it gets and why it's politicized so much because of the importance of that organization to the city of San Antonio. Well, again, congratulations. Thank you. You know, it, it is a huge uh, honor, as you said. It is work, though. You're putting in a lot of work and it is, it is something that you wanted to do. What well, made you want to do this? Honestly, when I was approached to, to apply, I declined it several times. And I think part of it was I knew what it meant. I knew that it meant that I would be thrusted back into politics. And politics can be tough. <laughs> you have to have a thick skin. And it's not for everybody. And really, my business model has never been to be a politician. Yeah. And, and it's always been to make a social, make, make a difference. Mm-hmm. And, and leverage how to influence people to make that difference. There's a difference. I haven't made decisions when I've been involved with an organization to stay in, in power. Those decisions have been made to influence so that others can benefit from it who are not at the table. It's a different philosophy, right? And I think at the end of the day, why I chose to do it was my father was a mechanic at CPS. Oh. And my father had the night shift. And I think I made the, and I, I know that I made the decision and ultimately boiled down to this. Again, my father had an impeccable work ethic, never missed work, was afraid to miss work yeah. because he didn't want to be fired. Yeah. Uh, when you don't have an education, a formal education, and you have a GED, I, I think that again, you, you're afraid to lose your job. And then when you're, you become an American citizen, I think more so you're afraid. You're afraid of a lot of things. And I got to see him in that capacity and um, and it kind of sometimes bothered me that he was that concerned sometimes to even miss a day of work, right? And it, and it kind of also, he worked the night shift and I really saw him. And 
there was a lot of things about it. I think ultimately it was like, wow, at the end of the day, my, my dad sacrificed a lot. If a daughter of a mechanic can rise, and I'm sorry, the sentimental. Yeah, and that's beautiful. This is beautiful. Can rise to be the chairman of an organization <laughs> that has only had seven women in power. Why not? It, no that's okay you're making me emotional too because so many of our parents and grandparents have lived that same life that you're talking about you know and that's you know, it wasn't it didn't come the decision didn't come for the title it didn't come from oh i wanted i wanted to control the political narrative of the organization or how it influences a lot of decisions in the city of san antonio it really boiled down to that I come from blue collar and to have the opportunity to serve and to be part of that transformation of what the board looks like that yeah. historically has been Anglo and been, been controlled by 1% yeah. of a 78209, um, you know, to, to, to be in that position, to know that you're part of that transformation of what the board looks like and to know what challenges will come from that. Uh, but at the end of the day, the driving force is to say that the sacrifices of Mexican American parents or Mexican or immigrant parents or first generation parents, that their sacrifice and then your own personal desire to to change your circumstances can lead to this opportunity and to demonstrate that this Mexican girl that nobody saw anything special in is there is why I did it. <laughs> well, that's, again, that's empowering, you know, and that says something, Sorry. you know, if you're watching this, if, if you've thought about how we're, how we're raising our children, if you thought about opportunities and making stuff happen, it can be done. Yeah, it can be done. It's, it's, and even after you reach it, uh, that opens a whole other set of yeah. learning and, and, and understanding the reality of it. But I mean, I, I think ultimately the, the decision to make it was to honor my parents, but to, to, to understand the significance of that organization and to understand that, you know, um, there's, 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 you can't always make your decision always based on what you're going to get out of it is understanding that, you know, you're making it on behalf of a lot of little girls, minority yeah. men, and, men and women, regardless of gender, yeah, yeah. that don't see themselves like that. Yeah. That don't. Yeah, and that's and, and, why. And how do you, how do we have more opportunities like that, right? Yeah. It's so I was very thoughtful in it, and I'm still very thoughtful about it. And it's still a lot of work because nobody wants, I mean, I'm going to say nobody wants you to do that. Nobody... Nobody sees that side of why you make things, why you make those decisions. They see the, oh, you know, the other stuff that's not always so positive about it. Okay. So you've been in the position for six months or so, yeah. you know, prior to that you had served on the board, but yep. now you're the president, the chairman, the you chair, the chairman, the chair. What have you learned in the first six months? Well, um, I have learned that how I approach things in, in business or even in life, I have to probably pivot significantly. Um, is all I can say for now. <laughs> I, I think that um, I've learned that what comes really natural f for me is to be a solution provider. And um, not to say that leadership does not come natural to me, but because of the complexity and the dynamics of how the organization functions and how it interacts with key organizations such as the city of San Antonio and others and the amount of stakeholders and interests that um, there's a lot that happens. There's a lot of, a lot of agendas that are taking place and, um, you have to be, I mean, I've always been really good with situational awareness, but the level of situational, of situational awareness and uh, how you have to be prepared is at a different level that I can <laughs> articulate the way that I would like okay. without going into more detail. Well, that's, that's, that says something. But again, it's, it's at a hyper level 
of 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 uh, dynamics. I've always been uh, exposed to some really tough terrain. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> this is at a whole other level. This is Mount Everest uh, of that tough terrain. I would say for sure, <laughs> for sure. And I I think coming out of this, I'm gonna gain some phenomenal new skills. Uh, I okay. Would say that right now. So coming out of this, how long is your appointment? It's two. Well, my appointment potentially can be ten years serving on the board. Chairman is only two, unless I'm asked to stay a little longer. And so I know you don't have your eyes on anything else, but will you serve in any other positions? Do you have your hopes and, and, and heart set on something I, I else? I think that this, this, if I can successfully, um, you know, um, successfully uh, serve my time with, as chairman and as, as uh, regardless of what my tenure is, uh, five years or 10 years or seven years, it definitely currently now I have opportunities to serve on paid boards. Right now I make, I get paid a small stipend. Uh, you potentially can be on boards like Southwest Airlines and Amazon and a bunch of other. Yeah, I need to be boards. on Southwest Airlines. <laughs> My point is that this opens the door for for more corporate boards with with some opportunities that I think would be great. Well, I um, see you. I see you in those. And to, also, to be honest with you, this could also open potentially if I ever you know, if a presidency's uh, value in, in my experience could be, you know, could be a nominee for a Department of Energy Secretary, for example. I mean, I think that they could open a lot of doors, you know, uh, a president seeing potential or governor, you know, seeing potential in my experience in the area of energy and technology and open other doors. I, I don't think I want to run for office. I get that asked a lot. Um, yeah, I, I wondered one, if you want I to make any once, announcements. I ran once for office. Uh, when I was much younger, I think I was 24, I learned some lessons there. And uh, no, I'm not interested in running for public office. I'm interested in supporting good candidates, people who are currently serving, and then just really uh, uh, wanting my next 10, 15 years really leveraging my corporate experience in a different capacity. Well, listen, all of this to say, I mean, there's a lot of things to be said, but it's inspiring to hear, mm. you know, where you've been, where you're at, where you're going. It's inspiring to be around you. You know, I appreciate you when you make it to that cabinet level. Don't forget <laughs> me because they need a communications guy like me in there sure. to be able to navigate. Sure. And you got to have got to elect the right president. We'll, see what well let's see if that <laughs> happens too. you know, you, you know, you you have uh, been someone who, in my opinion, you know, lifts as they climb. So when you go up, you bring people with you, you bring people's names into the rooms, you're speaking other people's names, you're looking to get people involved because that's what leadership does. Leadership doesn't, you know, say, gimme, gimme, gimme. Leadership empowers Actually, leadership other leaders. Says, gimme, gimme, gimme. Well, yeah, in some you ways. You choose what kind of leader you want to be. Absolutely. But, yeah. but, but, but also empowering other people to be leaders as well is important part of leadership. You know, and, and I, sometimes I take issue with the word empower because it, it implies to me that you still have to ask for permission. Um, <laughs> I think it's not about empowering people. I think it's just really guiding people, uh, um, you know, uh, inspiring people, guiding people, educating people, bringing awareness to them that they, they have the potential. But I still think that that's part of some of the opportunities that we have. We use the word a lot, empower. I think what we do a lot of is motivate people, but I think what we really need to tell people is like, you don't need to ask for permission to do that, but this is how you do it. I think we need to do more of that. Well, there you go, folks. If you learn anything from tonight's show, Janie's not asking for permission from nobody. <laughs> no, why should we ask for permission? <laughs> I think that what you need to do is, again, have a vision for yourself and try to figure it out how to get there. And if you don't know how to do it, you know, first of all, there's no excuses anymore. Everything that you can think of is on, you know, it's YouTube. on Google. It's, it's on the <laughs> search engines or directories or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I think that the I think that the access to information is there. I think what's not there enough is the exposure and the experience and how to do it. Right? Yeah, that's it. And I think that's where asking questions and, you know, uh, learning through observation like I did. Uh, whenever once in a while you get a great mentor, you know, learn more, uh, learn on the job training, all those, all that combination is what will get you there. But I don't think having to be empowered should be the reason why, you, you know, you have to, you should do it.
So what does Janie do when she's not working? Um, what do you like to do? I should say. Well, you know, I have a, I have a, a small circle of, of friends. I think they they know me is I like to, uh, get, you know, get together with them. And of course we always talk business, <laughs> but <laughs> that's good. Um, we talk business, we talk, you know, strategy, we talk about, you know, reminding ourselves to, to be good with the, you know, to, to ourselves and each other. Um, I do a lot of, uh, of course, and I think this happened a lot with COVID just stream, stream a lot. And I like to watch documentaries a lot. What type uh, of documentaries? I think, uh, oh God, really bio biographies, okay. right? People okay. People like this summer, I think I really got into, I was really impressed with uh, learning about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Ooh, I yeah. This was great. I thought even the one recently with, you know, the boxer, the golden boy was very oh, good. Oh, De La Hoya. Yeah. I, there was so many things that I could relate mm. to. Um, I think the other one that I really liked was the one, the the disco queen. What was her name? Donna Summers. Yeah. I thought hers was good. Sinead O'Connor's was good. Oh, yeah. Rest in I peace. Liked, and, then I, uh, and then Law and Order. <laughs> A lot of good. dramas. Lot legal. Legal stuff. Uh, I, you know, I think I'm drawn to the emotional side and problem solving of things. I think it's a way for me to learn, relate, and, you know, um, it's usually more serious stuff. I, I don't do a lot of rom-coms. That's know? okay. Uh, but, you know, watch TV. Yeah. You know, um, I also got into this new habit of, I, I moved back to the west side of San Antonio actually three years ago, and we have a very unique property you know, on a couple of acres. And um, I've started this new thing where I start with my coffee. We talked about it earlier. I usually do two there and one at the office. And uh, I'll, I'll go outside and I just enjoy the west side. And, and the west you. side of San Antonio is like, you know, you see, you hear the tra train tracks are right next to us. You, you hear you know, the drag racing that takes place by the highway. <laughs> you, you see these interesting, the migration, the birds, for whatever reason, migrate through there. You see these beautiful birds. And you hear the dogs barking that are usually roaming around. Um, the, the diversity of what it is to live in the inner city uh, is a way that I relax sometimes. I, I And then we recently got a pool, so seeing the water, I think, is a new way for me to kind of just like, bed, you know, just kind of yeah. be one with my environment that reminds me how far I've gone and then allows me to kind of have that time by myself uh, to start the day. Because once I go into the office, I, I go straight into work. There's very little downtime or even lunch. The other sin that I do have is uh, I do, if you ever want to see me in person, uh, maybe this is too much information. <laughs> I have a table at supper, <laughs> uh, the restaurant supper. And, and that's another thing is I do like quiet time by myself. And so a nice breakfast or I have a lot of meetings there. And that kind of also is my kind of way of still enjoying my breakfast time, but also engaging in some meaningful conversations, you know. Um, so watching, again, docs of biographies specifically, some quiet time alone or breakfast at my favorite spot. Well, it sounds like you're in a good place with that too, though. So, you know, congratulations on that Thank because you. that comes with time as well, right? I well, mean, that comes with under, yeah, that comes with, you know, different things work for me over time and I don't have time to work out. Um, I don't have time to take the vacations that I like. Oh, one thing I also do is I have a seven year old and she loves uh, Airbnbs. Oh, wow. So uh, I know that came out of COVID. Um, <laughs> she couldn't play with kids. And so we started staying at hotels that were like 75% off. Uh, nobody was going. And Airbnbs for her to actually get to do something. And so that's why we got the pool so I could stop spending money on that. Um, and then also that she likes the experience, right? She yeah. likes to pack and unpack because she travels with me a lot. And I don't have time right now. I haven't had time since post, during COVID or post COVID to have like nice vacations. So we do a lot of these sprint you know, vacations with her, yeah. you know, uh, with her. She likes them. Good. And that that's for mainly, mainly for her, but it, it, I always take friends with me so that they can kind of like be the tias and godmothers <laughs> and kind of like watch her. But it's an opportunity for me to, you know, bond with her, but at the same time to kind of in, in some ways have a little bit of 
a break, but she yeah. loves Airbnbs and we choose them all by the experience. She's going to have my seven year old. <laughs> so. Well, that's beautiful. And she's got a great role model and someone to look up to. And I can only imagine what type of Latina CEO she will become. Oh, she's an excellent negotiator. <laughs> I have never met someone that's so great at negotiating. There um, you go. She's definitely deals. Very, well, it's interesting. No, she negotiates a lot with me. <laughs> I'm a very um, strict parent, a disciplinary in the family. So I don't easily budge. <laughs> and so she's really good at sh coming to me and saying, well, I would like to do the following. And when she tells me, I'll say, well, no, this is a, no, we can't. And this is why. And then she'll come back and she goes, I thought about what you said. <laughs> and uh, would you be open to this? And then I'm like, no, and this is why. And then, you know, a couple of 30 minutes later, an hour later, then she comes back and she goes, well, you said no to this. You said no to this. And here's like my final proposition. And then I'll say like, OK, I can't argue with that. There you go. And I really do appreciate that. It's yeah. a little scary that at seven she has the capacity to understand um, how I think, what she wants, and then how to accomplish that. So sh that's kind of very interesting. That's one of, it's one of the things I really admire about Billie Jane, that she has this way of getting what she wants without using, without throwing tantrums, you know, without um, just, you know, really th throwing a tantrum. Yeah. She, just, she just knows what she wants and she knows how to accomplish it and knows, basically knows how to influence one of the toughest persons to influence in the room. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a very pretty impressive. It is impressive. It, it sounds is. like well, she got it. She got it from the best. <laughs> yeah, apparently, she did. And so, send Janie your documentary, Netflix, all your Hulu <laughs> yeah, recommendations. Yeah, I love them, especially if there's you know something I get to learn. Yep. Yeah. And then we're also we also owe you lunch at supper, the restaurant, because breakfast. we'll get her breakfast because it's Janie's belated birthday. We oh, we yes. had to give you a happy. Yeah. It's your yes. birthday month. What is it? The birthday week? The birthday what? What do we call this? Um. What? I, well, my birthday was last week. So happy belated birthday. Thank in you. other words. Thank you. No, I mean, it definitely was not a birthday month. <laughs> um, it definitely wasn't a birthday week. I didn't get to really celebrate it. Um. Uh, until Sunday with some, again, a handful of good friends. My good friend Heidi uh, actually um, took the time to coordinate something for me because I was busy. Everybody's kind of used to my annual birthday party where I invite everybody. It's really more of a birthday party to see my friends yeah. because I'm so busy all the time. And this year I was like, I just don't have time. They're like, what? You're not having your annual party? And I said, I just don't have the bandwidth. And she was like, let me take care of it. And Ooh. she did. We had it at a really good place. Um, my good friend, Erica Rodriguez, who owns Cuba 1918. Nice place. And it was nice because one of the things I am is a big supporter of small business. And so anytime I have any events, whether I'm hosted at my house, whether I'm hosted at Webhead, whether it's my birthday, I select vendors that are small who are making a difference in the community. And so a lot of my colleagues had never been there and they were just so blown away with what Erica and her husband Ray had been able to do again on my part of town, right? The corner of Quintana Road and, and South Cross on this part of town. And so I always met, try to ma optimize any opportunity that I can with the people that I love and maximize exposure to the people that are trying to do great things. I do things very intentionally, even celebrating my birthday. Yeah. This was the first time someone was intentional with, let me take care of it. You, you do so much. <laughs> it was nice. Actually, it was really nice. Well, thank you for being here tonight, oh, Jane. You've you. you've spoken a lot about so many wonderful things. I went by fast. I it always like goes I by so an, fast. I didn't an, uh, answer anything. <laughs> well, <laughs> give us some important. closing words. Anything you'd like no, to add? I anything that you might have any, forgotten? If anybody sent any inquiries, maybe I can answer. We've that. we've got a few that say great show and Janie's amazing. Is there anybody so, who has a question? I don't know. Does any do any of our live viewers have any questions across all question, of the platforms that we're streaming right now? Question. We will we will get to those. We'll have to send you those <laughs> later. We're I'm still sure. uh, collecting those across all the platforms that this is live streaming on, folks. Sure. I think if anything, you know, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Sorry, I got a little. Well, I'm not apologizing for getting no, you were, but um, you know, I I think if anything, if you can walk away anything from what took place today, that there's power in being uh, expressing raw emotion and being very intentional with your life and then how you operate. 
Um, I think that oftentimes, you know, we don't we, we think that that's a vulnerability, but it actually is your biggest strength. And that uh, we've come a long way as minority men and women, and we still need to find ways to scale up and, 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 and do a better job. And then just to, I'm sure you're going to plug that I will be launching my own finally, Ooh. potentially, I haven't had time, uh, Latina CEO show. And so I'm looking forward to growing that base and collaborating with you, Matt. You know, there it is, to- folks. There it is. The Latina CEO show it's going to be up and running Janie always a pleasure and, always and a pleasure you're, too you know you I can only see your show taking off because you know <laughs> so know. many people you've got a lot to say and it really helps also shape the brand and all of the work that you're doing and it is going to give people a yeah, place to come it's find like you. anything else you you know you, there's a lot of things you want to do we're very guilty wanting to do it all but I do believe that you can't serve too many masters. You know, <laughs> you, you have to be as much as you sometimes it feels like, oh, my God, I'm losing out. Timing is everything. And when you prioritize uh, what you want out of life and what you want accomplished, then you'll always find an opportunity to to do other things. It's, timing is important. And prioritize, you know, prioritizing how you want to accomplish things is important because if you don't give it equal investment, then it doesn't work out the way you want. And so having the self-discipline to say, I, I, it won't do that well. I, 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 I won't start it if I can't do it well is really important. There you go. And as Thank you very much again. Truest words, great words. Folks, that's our show here tonight. Guylin Jackson making all these squeaky clean streams come true to your screens. We love y'all folks. Tune in next week. We'll see you back here at Vod Pod Maximo Show every Tuesday night. Stay tuned for San Pluto Show with Amzilla. And we love y'all. We hope y'all are doing well. Uh, And that's it. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much. Hey.